Okay, thanks. Thanks everyone for coming. Uh, today I'm going to give a presentation on Apache Kafka, and it's mostly about our newly introduced feature, this intra-class replication within Kafka. So just a little bit uh, uh, introduction, quick introduction of myself. Uh, I'm currently a software, software engineer at LinkedIn. I've been there since uh, 2010, where I mostly work on developing Kafka as well as supporting the operation and the usage of Kafka at LinkedIn. So just a little bit of history of Kafka. Kafka was originally developed and then used at LinkedIn. And in 2011, LinkedIn decided to donate Kafka's code to Apache when we became an incubator project. And towards the end of last year, we actually graduated as a top level Apache project. Uh, so that's uh, where we are now. So other than Apache Kafka, uh, I also worked on another Apache project, Cassandra, um, before LinkedIn. And uh, earlier, I think uh, I was also a database researcher uh, in one of the IBM research labs. So here's the outline of the talk. So I'm going to start with a quick overview of Kafka and uh, its application. And after that, I will give you a quick description of the overall of the architecture of Kafka and it's a little bit uh, internal uh, details. And after that, I will explain how we extended the current system to support this new replication feature. I will talk a little bit about our performance and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions towards the end. So what is Kafka? So in one sentence, Kafka is a distributed pub-sub messaging system. But what's more important is to understand what people use Kafka for. So since Kafka is donated to Apache, we have seen usage uh, in many places outside LinkedIn. And uh, for example, Twitter, Box, Foursquare, a lot of those web 2.0 companies have been using Kafka internally. And more recently, we have seen more and more some more traditional enterprise companies starting to use uh, Kafka. So what do people really use Kafka for? Um, it turns out there are p different people are using Kafka for different purposes. So in one typical use case, people use Kafka as a log aggregator. So a lot of people have those problems. They have various kinds of logs sitting in various servers. They need a place to aggregate those data together and then potentially eventually load those data into Hadoop for batch processing, for ad hoc analysis. And this is a place that Kafka can be used for. There are some other people where they just want to create a live stream of data and have some kind of processing um, code be, uh, behind this live stream. So they will consume those data in real time as they come. Another important use case of Kafka is monitoring. This uh, Kafka has been used in many places for monitoring the healthiness of uh, individual services. It can be used to monitor the healthiness of machines and for collecting various kind of logs. So monitoring is another big use case of Kafka. So last but not least, so Kafka can also be used for traditional message queuing. So there are lots of applications where they want to generate a large of number of events or messages, uh, but they don't want to process, process those immediately. They want to have a buffer or a place to queue those things. And asynchronously, there's some daemon that will process those later on. So Kafka can serve as a big queue for buffering all those uh, outstanding messages. So since LinkedIn is one of the early adopters of Kafka, so all those use cases have more or less been used and exercised at LinkedIn. So in the next couple of slides, what I'm going to do is just walk through with you some of the use cases and the deployment at LinkedIn for Kafka. So if you are a LinkedIn user, you probably have seen this page. This is, if you log into LinkedIn, this is the network update stream in your main home page that we will see. Uh, those get updated as new updates, comments, like connections are showing up. This is a second screenshot. This is actually uh, the internal graph, we call, which, which we call in-graph, that we use for monitoring all the LinkedIn internal services. And it tells us uh, some of the basic metric. In this particular case, is our key value store of Baltimore. We want to measure its QPS over time. In both those cases, uh, the uh, Kafka is used as one of the underlying technology 
to provide either the feeds and or provide the monitoring capability. So just a little bit more detail. This is actually a bit uh, more detailed deployment of Kafka within LinkedIn. So at LinkedIn, our mission for Kafka is to collect all kinds of interactive data and deliver this data to wherever they want. And this interact, interactive data, some of them are human generated. So for example, the network upstream data that you saw earlier is sort of kind of human interactive data. But we also track things like page views, impressions, and uh, searches people, uh, search keywords people typed in. Some of the other interaction, interactive data can be machine generated. These are some of the monitoring uh, data that we talked about uh, that can be the internal metrics of a, of a Java service, can be the metric collect on the IO, CPU, or network stats, and can be some of uh, your service log as well. So we collect those data and we want to feed those to all the consumers. So some of the consumers are real time, as you will see some of those live services have those arrows pointing back to them. So those are the services that consume some of those uh, live streams in real time. A lot of those are news related applications or security related, app related applications. And monitoring is an uh, example of this real time consumer because it wants to consume all the metrics data that we logged and then plot all those graphs in real time. There's some other consumers that's more offline. So you can see the other pipeline, the horizontal pipe, where we take that feed and push that into our offline analysis data center. Eventually, we're going to load this data into our Hadoop cluster and uh, maybe our data warehouse system so that we can run reporting, we can run batch queries, and we can run all those sort of uh, ad hoc analysis. This is a sort of an offline use case of the same set of data. We also have the reverse pipeline. Because you will see the arrows, I think, from Hadoop to Kafka points the other way as well. So this, in some sense, is like the queuing usage, where we have lots of applications where they want to generate some data in Hadoop, but they want to deliver those data eventually through the live system. So we provide a pipe to buffer all those uh, messages that to be processed asynchronously, and we deliver them from the offline data center to the online data center, and eventually those will be consumed by some of the live services there. So uh, in summary, I think we, have, we are collecting all those interactive data, and we deliver the, all those data to both the real-time use case as well as the offline use case using a single system. In terms of volume, um, it's pretty sizable. On a typical day, we are collecting in the order of tens of billions of events which translates to uh, a couple of terabytes compressive data uh, in our system. And uh, on the consumer side, we are consuming about five times of messages. So each message on average is consumed five times. We're consuming a total of in the order of 50 billion uh, messages on a given day. So why do people choose to use Kafka? Uh, as a matter of fact, there are lots of other messaging systems, both in the open source world and then in the commercial world. Um, also, I think Kafka, in terms of feature, uh, is lacking uh, compared with some of the other systems. In particular, we don't really support GMS protocol, and then we don't have a lot of the richness in terms of features. But here are some of the reasons why people choose to use Kafka. The first thing is Kafka is actually built as a scale-out distributed system uh, from ground up. Uh, we are lucky because we started this project just only two to three years ago. And at the time when we started, we actually have access to things like Zookeeper, which allows us to build such a distributed system easier. And the second thing is, unlike some of the other messaging system, uh, which only supports a sort of real-time use case, Kafka actually persists all its messages on disk. So we persist to disk. So this allows us to support not only the real-time use cases where you can actually just probably buffer a lot of data in memory, but also for some of the offline use cases. For example, the ETL use case is a good offline use case because it's really used for batch analysis. And uh, sometimes your, bat your offline system can be, can be down for uh, a longer period of time for repairing. And by having those data so persist to disk, give us a bigger buffer uh, for queuing things. A third thing we have is we have tuned our system to deliver this high throughput. 
And you have seen some of the numbers we use at LinkedIn. But for benchmark, each, each Kafka server is capable of delivering tens of megabytes of, uh, 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 of throughput for both the sort of uh, publishing side as well as the subscribing side, depending on their configuration. Last but not least, so Kafka is a multi-subscription system. As you have seen earlier, each published message can be potentially consumed by multiple independent consumers. And uh, this is actually a useful feature for stream processing. For example, Twitter Storm system uses Kafka for because of this uh, multi-subscription feature. So, so I covered the old quick overview of Kafka. Now I'm going to drill a little bit into the internal architecture uh, of Kafka. In particular, how do we support some of the features that I mentioned in the previous slide? So this is a typical uh, so sort of deployment architecture of Kafka. Um, Kafka, we have those uh, server tier and client tier. Each our server is called a broker. Okay, and for the clients, we have two types of clients. One is producer client, which publishes data to the server, to the brokers. And we have those consumer clients, which makes a subscription to our data stream. And uh, once the subscription is made, they just keep fetching data from our brokers. As you can see from this picture, because we designed this system as a sort of scaled out or distributed system from ground up, all of those tiers uh, are distributed. So we can have a list, uh, a set of brokers form a Kafka cluster, and both our producer side and consumer side um, can be running on multiple threads or multiple instances, and it's fully distributed. And you can see all those broker information and consumer information, they are registered in Zookeeper, and, you were, and by using Zookeeper, I think we can handle some of the failures, and we can do load balancing when some of the failures occur um, to keep the load even. So before I get into some of the details, this is uh, just a little bit the uh, introduction of the terminologies. Kafka provides those uh, message streams. So each message stream is defined by this concept called topic. And under the cover, a topic is partitioned. Each, to each topic can have one or more partitions uh, under the knees of it. And all those partitions are sort of spread around among those brokers that you have seen earlier. And each partition, has, as you will see a little bit later, has a logical log associated with it on disk. And those messages, once they are published, are sort of added to this log. And each message has sort of a unique identifier, um, which we call this uh, offset. And given the offset, we can fetch the message for you, and then you can, uh, you can make use of this message. So this is the basic terminology. In terms of APIs, so in Kafka, I think the API is pretty simple. We have just two set of APIs, one for the producer and one for the consumer. So if you have a producer, basically what you can do is you can create one or more messages and send those messages in a single send request. As you can see, in this particular case, we are trying to create a message for topic one. And in terms of the message itself, in this particular case, the message is a string, uh, message one. Uh, but it can be actually any type, as long as you define an encoder that can convert from your original data type into a byte array. Then we can send those data. Optionally, you can also give us a key. In this case, it's not used. The key is null. But if you want, you can provide us a key associated with this message. Then the difference there is, in addition, in, instead of picking a random partition to store this message, we are going to take this key and hash it and deterministically pick a partition to store your message. So some other applications want to do this uh, partition way based on key um, because they want to group the data in a certain way. Now in terms of consumer, the API is also rather simple. If you want to consume some data, again, you just create this uh, message stream on a particular topic. Um, you can actually give us a set of topics, or you can give us a regex pattern, which match one or more topics. You can pick up some of the topics dynamically. In addition to specifying a topic, you can also tell us how many substream you want uh, out of this stream. In this particular case, we just want to order data to be fed into a single stream. 
So once you get this stream, the stream supports an iterator API. So you can just call iterator on it, and as you are iterating this, you get each other message back, and you can process it. So it's pretty simple. So in the next slide, what I'm going to do is just drill into a particular area uh, in terms of throughput. I want to cover how we design our system to deliver this high throughput. There are a few things that we, uh, we have done to make our throughput, uh, throughput reasonable. The first thing we, we have is the underlying persistent storage we have within the Kafka is pretty simple. If you look into a particular broker, there is a, there's a log associated with each topic partition. Each log is formed uh, by one or more of those segments. Okay? And if you zoom into a particular segment, it's also pretty simple. It has a, a data, data log, which, uh, where we just have messages sort of uh, accumulated one after another. And we have a smaller file, which is the index file, that maps from the ID, which is the offset of message, into the location of that file. Okay? This is really for reads. And in terms of operation, once a m message is published, uh, eventually they will be appended to one of the, to the last segment uh, within a log. And if you are consuming a message, basically you will give us an offset to see you know, from, w from which offset you want to start consuming a message. And we will use this index to find the location of those messages and we will give you those data back. Normally, those. Uh, Locked segments are kept for a certain configured period of time. Sometimes, you know, it can be a few days or a week. Once those data get old, those old segments simply just get deleted. So as you can see, all those locked segments, they are append only, and uh, they never get updated in place. So in terms of access pattern, is actually pretty simple. And uh, once they get old, they're deleted as a whole. So it's pretty efficient. And earlier, you have seen our producer API. We have this batched API. So when you send some data, you can choose to send us a set of messages instead of a single one. So that amortizes the overhead across the network. And we have the same thing on the consumer side. When we do a read, our consumer library can sort of fetch a big chunk of data um, to amortize the RPC overhead. A third thing we have, which is pretty interesting, we are using this. Uh, Sandfire API that's available in a lot of Linux and Unix system. What that allows us to, uh, to do is to do this uh, zero copy transfer, which means it can take some bytes in the local file channel and send it directly to a remote socket directly without going through the application space. So this is efficient because it uh, gives us uh, it bypasses a lot of kernel overhead. It also uh, reduce a lot of extra copying back and forth between the kernel and the user space. So that's also a uh, pretty big win for us. <coughs> Last but not least, uh, we support compression. Um, our compression is end-to-end. -end. The compression typically happens on the producer side, where we take a set of messages and compress them. And those compressed message set sort of stays all the way in the broker and into the consumer library. It's only when the consumer wants to start iterating those messages, that's when they get decompressed. So we save a lot of bandwidth to transfer the data uh, across those uh, various layers, uh, from the producer to the broker and to the consumer. And on this, it also stays in this uh, compressed format. So that's how we achieve this uh, high throughput. So now I covered sort of the basic architecture of, Link, uh, of Kafka. Uh, in the next uh, 10 or 12 slides, what I'm going to do is to go through uh, our design of adding this replication feature and how we extended our current system to support this intra-cluster replication. So just to start with, why do we need replication? Well, first of all, I think just like any system, our brokers or server can go down. And the most common reason for our broker to go down is actually um, expected because we want to bring down our broker uh, because uh, we have to deploy some new code or we have to deploy some new configs. This is actually uh, a majority of our failure cases. Then occasionally, individual broker can go down because either your operating system crashes or there's a bug in our uh, Kafka layer where 
where we have to shut down the server, or maybe your underlying storage has a problem. Okay. Now, what happens if a broker goes down? In our current release, in our existing releases, if a broker goes down, that means all the partitions on that broker are unavailable because we don't have redundancy across brokers. So that means you can't, the producers cannot publish to these brokers, and consumers cannot consume or fetch from those brokers. So neither is Sideo. And if you have a really hard storage problem, which means uh, your data is gone forever, right? Then whatever unconsumed data you have on that broker is permanently gone, is permanently lost. So you have data loss in this case. So by adding replication, we, uh, our goal is to improve both the availability as well as durability of our system. So be before I talk about the specific implementation of Kafka replication, it's probably useful to revisit this uh, cat theorem. So some, some people probably are fam already familiar with this. This is a concept developed, proposed, sort of by a Berkeley professor, I think Eric Brewer. So the basic idea is if you are building a replicated distributed system, typically you can only pick two out of the three features. These three features are strong consistency among your replicas, high availability of your system, tolerating of natural partitioning. So among those three things, uh, you, it's, it's almost impossible or very hard to build a system that can satisfy all the three, but you can build a system that satisfies two out of three, and you have to pick which two you want. So in Kafka, what we picked is the first two. We picked consistency and availability. The fundamental reason is our intra-class replication is designed for a cluster that sits within the same data center. And in that scenario, we expect network partition to be really rare within the same data center. But in return, what we can do is we can optimize the other two. Um, in, in particular, this means we can build these strongly consistent replicas, meaning those replicas are byte-wise consistent all the time, not eventually. We can build a system that's highly available. And in some of our preliminary experiments, um, a typical failure over time, uh, when, when there's a failure, um, you have to fail over. The unavailability window during this failure over is typically less than uh, a few milliseconds, which is, uh, which is uh, pretty good. So, so now we need to extend our existing system to support this replication. So the first thing we have to do is to add replicas. Now, a partition will have one or more replicas based on your configuration. And those replicas, as you can see in this picture, are spread around in those brokers. So for those little box of the same color, they are replicas of the same topic partition. And we try to distribute them so more or less evenly, amount of brokers uh, for load balancing. Once we have those replicas, uh, we have to keep them consistent. And since we want to build a strong consistent system, we have to make sure they are byte-wise consistent all the time. So typically, the way you do that, if you want to build this strongly consistent system, is you have to pick one of the replica as the leader. So all the writes have to go through that leader. And leader is responsible for ordering those writes, and is responsible for having this data propagated to all the rest of the replicas, which are called followers, typically, in exactly the same order. Only in this way, I think, you can make sure the replicas are identical. Another thing that the leader has to do is to decide when to commit a, commit a piece of data, which means when it's considered a piece of data is, has reached enough replicas and safe and won't be lost when there are failures and when there are replica fa failures. So uh, in the literature, there are also a couple of ways of uh, doing that, how, how the leader decides how to commit the message. And uh, the most popular way is to do this quorum-based commit, this actual approach used in Apache Zookeeper. The basic idea is when the leader gets a piece of data, it waits until a majority of the replicas have received that piece of data before it commits that data. Okay? So it waits for a majority, not everybody. So the plus, uh, the plus part of this approach is it gives you pretty good latency 
which means if one of the replica for some reason is slow, it doesn't affect the time to commit a message because it doesn't need everybody. But the downside of this approach is uh, it means it actually can tolerate uh, less failure than you would uh, hope it, it does. In particular, if you have two F plus one replicas, you can only tolerate F failures. That means you have three replicas, you can only tolerate one failure. You have two replicas, you can tolerate zero failure. You can't tolerate any failure in this case. So this actually, although this is okay for a system like Zookeeper because it's really intended to store state information, it's not a lot of data, which means you can actually afford to use more replicas if you want more redundancy uh, to support failure cases. But for Kafka, we, uh, it's a little hard for us to do that because Kafka stores real data. And you have seen some early numbers. A lot of data are flowing through Kafka. Having actual replicas uh, will significantly increase the storage overhead. So we can't afford to do that. So ideally, what we want to have is if you have 2F plus 1 replicas, we want to be able to tolerate 2F failures. Right? We can tolerate more failures. Um, and if that means you have to trade a little bit off of the latency, um, that maybe uh, is a good trade off. So the next slide, I'm going to cover how Kafka did uh, this uh, uh, commit protocol. So this slide sort of uh, roughly describes how we commit data. So at leader, uh, we, the leader maintains this uh, concept of called ISR, which is in sync replicas. So this is sort of the set of uh, replica, replicas that are alive and that have caught up fully with the current leader. That's why it's called this in sync replicas. So initially, when the, top, when the topic partition is created, every replica is in this uh, in sync replica set. Okay? And if you have a message coming in, the leader basically wait until this message is received by every replica. Okay? Once the uh, message is received by everybody, it commits this message. Then at some point, it may have failures. Now, in particular, one of the follow replicas could fail. Right? In this case, the leader can't wait forever. So what we do is, in this case, the leader will recognize one of the follower uh, is gone. So it will take it out of this uh, ISR because it's no, it, it can no longer keep it in sync uh, with itself. Okay. Now, the once it has shrinked this in sync replica set, the leader can start committing new messages to the rest of, rest of that replicas using the current in sync replica set. As you can see in this case, we don't block for the committing of the message, uh, but the trade off is now the system is actually running in this under replicated case, right? Because there are fewer replicas, but at least the system is still available. So the main benefit of this approach is now we do can tolerate more failures uh, with F replicas, we can tolerate F minus one uh, failures. In terms of latency, it, uh, because you have to wait uh, for all the replicas in the steady state, right, when all the replicas are up, uh, up to date and in sync with the leader. Um, the latency could be a little bit long, but since Kafka is really designed for a class within the same data center, we, ex we assume the latency due, uh, caused by this network delay is relatively small, so we can tolerate this. So we just described this protocol this picture sort of just illustrates how it works in a sort of graphical way. As you can see in this way, we have a cluster with three brokers, one, two, three. And there's only one partition with uh, three replicas. Okay? And one of the replica in this case, the replica on broker one, is the leader. The other two replicas are basically followers. If you are a producer, uh, once the produce, producer publishes a message, the message first flows to the leader, in this case on broker one. And the leader takes this message and just add, appends it to its local log. And the followers just keeps pulling data from the leader, and once the follower receives those data, and it rises to its own local log. Okay? And the followers are pulling those data in exactly the same order as, as you notice that if there are two followers or multiple followers pulling from the same leader, they can do the pooling sort of independently, concurrently, because uh, they don't depend on each other. Once the leader has uh, realized that all the followers have received that, uh, that message, now it can commit it, uh, the data. That's in step three. Okay. And the producer actually have a choice of when to receive the acknowledgment. 
and it's actually summarized in the following table. The producer can choose not to receive any acknowledgement at all. Basically, you will just do blind publishing. Uh, in this case, it's really optimizing for latency, because in this case, it doesn't uh, take any network overhead to even publish the data. But the trade-off is uh, now if there's any failure, there could be data loss. In particular, there may be some data that you just buffer on the producer side is not even sent to socket, right? Because you are not waiting for uh, an acknowledgement. A producer can also choose to write, to wait until the leader has received a message, okay? In this case, the latency will be longer because now you have to wait for at least one round RPC trip, right? Um, the data loss will be less, but it can still happen because what can happen is maybe a message has only been received by the leader but hasn't been propagated to the followers, right? In this case, it hasn't been committed. So when there's a failure, uh, a small number of messages could still be lost. So the last option, if you really want your data to be uh, truly uh, persistent um, and can tolerate all the failures, you can choose to wait until uh, to receive an acknowledgement when the message is committed, which means it has received by all the replicas that are in sync. And in this particular case, it's all the replicas. In this case, the delay will be a little bit longer and because you have to take uh, two round trip uh, uh, network overhead. So there's a question? Is it possible to have cascaded replication? Uh, the question is, is it possible to have a cascaded replication? Uh, currently, we, th we haven't thought about that, but uh, in the future, we could uh, think about doing something like that. Now, we are just hoping to get a basic replication working. Uh, do we want to take the question now? Do we want to take the questions towards the end? Okay, let's leave it to the end. Okay, uh, but save your questions. Thanks. Okay, so this is just to extend this picture to uh, multiple partitions, multiple topics. In reality, I think there could be multiple partitions and then they each have its own leader. And uh, the same logic just happens and uh, our goal is to just spread the leaders among those uh, partitions more or less evenly among our brokers. So, so we'll talk about the uh, normal case when there's no failure. In the next couple of slides, I'll just uh, describe what happens when there are failures. There could be failures uh, in the followers when this replication thing is happening. There could be failures uh, on the leaders when this replication thing is happening. So this slide talks about what happens uh, when the follower fails. So to handle the follower failure, what we do is the leader maintains the offset of the last committed message. Okay. This last committed offset is propagated from the leader to all the followers asynchronously. And they are also checkpoint to disk periodically. So if a follower fails and comes back, the first thing it does is to recover from disk its last committed offset. Okay. Next thing it does is truncate its log to that last committed offset. Because up to a point, it knows uh, everything before that, it's safe, right? It's committed. Then it will just uh, refetch all the data since that offset from the current leader, and it tries to catch up from the current leader. Once it's fully caught up, this replica will be added back to this ISR set, which is the in sync replica set. Now we are back to the fully replicated mode. Okay, that's how we recover from follow failure. What happens to leader failures? So to handle leader failure, so what we did is we used the approach inspired by another Apache uh, project called Helix, uh, which is also sort of uh, developed and then contributed uh, to Apache at LinkedIn. And there's a Helix talk in Thursday. So the idea there is to use one of the broker that serves as a controller for all those uh, uh, detection of failures as well as electing new leaders. The benefit of having an embedded controller is to reduce the number of watchers you have to set in Zookeeper, so it reduces the Zookeeper load. So we have a one node broker serve as a controller, and it re registers all the watchers so that it will be notified when any of the broker goes down. So once the controller knows some broker is down, it will figure out what are the leaders are on those failed brokers. Those, for those leaders, you have to elect new ones because they are no longer available. And then the program is pretty simple. 
if the controller basically tries to select another replica that's in this in sync replica set as the new leader. Okay, and by convention, because all the replicas in this in sync replica set are guaranteed to have received all the committed messages. So in this fail over, we guarantee as long as a message is committed, it's, it will exist in the new leader's log. So we are guaranteed we won't lose those committed messages. So that's how we guarantee this uh, strong consistency under failure. Both this leader and ISR information are stored in Zookeeper. This is really just for the failure over of controllers. And we have to recover uh, when a controller fails, we have to read this information. And both this leader and ISR information, we expect them to change relatively infrequently because it only happens when failure occurs and the failures in general are rare. Okay, so now I've covered the main protocol. In the next slide, I'm just going to walk through with you a specific example so that we can hopefully have a better understanding of how this uh, uh, various failure cases work. Okay, so this is an example. Um, we're just focusing on a single partition with three replicas, uh, A, B, and C. Okay, one of the replica, replica A, is initially is the leader, and initially all the replicas are in sync with each other, so yeah, they are all in this uh, ISR set. Now, the leader can start accepting messages. In this case, you see the leader have received three messages, M1, M2, M3. Okay, at this point, only M1 has been propagated to all the replicas. So only M1 can be committed. Okay, so the leader can commit M1, but not M2 and M3. You see this uh, little uh, blue arrow? This points to the last committed offset. Okay, so now only M1 is committed, but M2 and M3 are not. Now imagine at this point, just right at this moment, replica A fails. What happens? So when this happens, What's the most important thing to do is we, we need to preserve M1 because M1 is committed, right? We can't lose this data. M2 and M3, they haven't been committed. So it's actually okay to lose that uh, if you uh, if need to. But you don't have to uh, be extremely careful to pre pr protect those. So that's what happens. Let's say uh, just right at, at the moment, replica A fails, okay? So now the first thing we have to do is we have to select a new leader. In this case, we can select either B or C as new leader uh, because both of them are in this uh, in sync replica set. Let's say in this case, we pick B, but actually we can pick C as well. But what's Im most important to know, notice here is both B and C have M1, which is this committed message. We don't lose those. A little bit uh, sort of interesting and unexpected thing uh, you will realize here is replica B in this case, has to further commit message M2, even though it wasn't committed by the previous leader. The reason we have to do that is when a new leader is elected, it knows its log has all the committed messages, but it doesn't know which ones are uncommitted. So just to be on the safe side, it chooses to commit everything it has. So in this case, why, that's why it has to commit this uh, message M2. Now, from the client's perspective, if a producer is waiting for message M2 to be committed uh, while, leader, while replica A was the leader, what will happen is uh, that producer will get an exception. So that exception basically tells this client that particular message may or may not be committed. So uh, it's up to the application to have to deal with. So in this particular case, we happen to have committed, but uh, it's up to the producer to try to uh, poke the system to figure this out. But the most important thing is we haven't lost any committed messages, which is M1. Now, new messages can be published to our system, let's say in this case M4, M5, and B can continue to commit those messages. And uh, those committed messages now are present in replica B and C, but A is still down, so it's not in A yet. At some point, replica A comes back. Okay. When A comes back, the first thing it does is to truncate its log to the last committed offset. In this case, it's M1. So basically removed both M2 and M3, okay? Um, and then after that, it basically refetch its data from the kernel leader, which is replica B, and it will get all the M2, M4, M5. 
And once the uh, one is fully synced it will be added to this in sync replica set. Now you can see all the replicas are in this fully synchronous mode. So as you can see in the end picture, with all those failures happening in the middle, all the committed messages, meaning M1, M2, M4, M5, they are all preserved in all the replicas, and all the replicas are still identical. For the message that's not committed, M3, uh, they don't e it doesn't exist in all the replicas. So that's how we keep all those replicas consistent and uh, how we recover from various failures. So now I covered sort of the uh, basic design of this uh, replication. Now in the next few slides, I'm going to give uh, just to quickly show you some of the performance numbers we have. So this is the setup. So we have a very simple setup. We have three brokers. We have one topic and one partition only. Uh, this partition has three replicas. So there's one replica on each of the three brokers. And when we publish message and consume message, we use a message size of a K bytes. So these are our basic numbers. The first slide I want to show you is the trade-off between this latency and durability. So earlier we had this slide talking about when the producer can choose to receive acknowledgement. Right? There are different choices. So this slide just quantify this number. So if the producer doesn't want to wait for any acknowledgement, um, when you publish a message, that message can be published uh, under 0.3 milliseconds. Okay, because you don't want, want to wait for any RPC call. Uh, these are pretty fast. But uh, the trade-off, of course, is there could be some amount of data loss if there's a failure. If you pick to wait for just a liter, now your latency is a little bit longer. It's in the order of millisecond. Uh, it's still not too bad, uh, but it's longer. Uh, now your data loss will be less, uh, but it can still happen. If you choose to wait for the message to be truly committed, now to publish message, you have to wait for about two milliseconds because now you doubled the overhead in terms of network. You not only have to wait for the data to be received by the leader, but they also have to be, the message also has to be re re uh, received by the followers as well. Okay, so that's why it's a bit longer, but the benefit now is with all those failures, you can guarantee your message is no longer lost. So this is the trade-off between this latency and the durability. In the next couple of slides, I'm gonna show you some of the throughput numbers. So throughput is a little bit orthogonal to latency. Uh, when, when you consider latency, I think uh, there's a trade-off between this latency and the durability. But given the same latency for all these uh, options uh, relative to the producer acknowledgement, you can actually improve your throughput uh, by doing two different things. One is you can improve your throughput by trying to send, in more, send more data for RPC requests. You basically batch more data for RPC requests. That's one way that you can amortize the network latency. The second thing you can do to improve throughput is to have more concurrent clients. If more clients, then jointly they can consume or publish more data. So that's another way you can improve throughput. So that's what you're gonna see, see in the next slide. So this slide, what we are sh showing here is the throughput in terms of megabytes per second we get versus the number of 1K byte messages we are sending per RPC request. On the x-axis, that shows how many messages uh, you are sending per send request. The y-axis shows you the megabytes per second. As you can see, for all those options, whether you, the producer doesn't want to wait for any acknowledgement or wait for the leader or wait for the message to be committed, they can all get better throughput as you are sending more and more data per request. And even for the the slowest one, which you have to wait for the message to be committed, they can still deliver uh, tens of megabytes uh, of throughput uh, on a single partition. Of course, if you have more partitions, more brokers, that throughput will be uh, just growing linearly. The second thing you can do, of course, is to fix the number of, the, the number of messages you send per request, but increase the number of uh, concurrent uh, producers you have. So here you will see the same effect by increasing the concurrent producers from one to 20, we can gradually drive throughput from less than a megabyte to almost 20 or 30 megabytes. Um, and uh, uh, of course, uh, if you don't want to for, wait for acknowledgement, you still get the highest throughput, but even for uh, 
the case where you have to wait for the message to be committed, you can still get uh, some sizable throughput. So this is my last slide in terms of uh, performance. This is uh, uh, the throughput on the consumer side. On the consumer side, you can do the same trick. And here I'm just showing that what's the throughput in terms of consumption you can get in terms of megabytes per second as you are varying the size you are fetching per RPC request. As you can see, as we scaled to fetch size to a megabyte, we pretty much can saturate the one gigabit link between the client and server. So this uh, throughput is pretty good. OK, so this, one, this is my last slide. So before I open it up for Q&A, just uh, want to give you a quick update of the status of uh, our next COC release, which is uh, uh, 0.8 release, which supports this intra-class replication feature. Um, we are in the sort of final phase of stabilizing and debugging it. And we hope we can ex uh, release that in March sometime. And uh, after 08, there are various places where we can improve the performance and throughput further, uh, which we'll do that in a following sort of point release. If you want to check out uh, more about Kafka, this is the, our website that you can go to, uh, where we have the design doc, some of the quick start, uh, and uh, we welcome people to try it out and uh, give us some feedback. If you're interested, there is a sort of Kafka meetup this evening, supposedly to be around eight, and I don't know the exact room here, but I think it'll be around this area. So if you're interested, we can, uh, uh, or you have a more detailed question, I'd be happy to uh, talk to some of you there, and we can have a more detailed sort of dive in of Kafka. Okay, so that's it for me. Any questions? Yes. Reach Kafka, uh, is that would that be for Zookeeper or a particular broker, or what is the producer consumer directly communicating with? Right. So in terms of configuration, I think in terms of uh, on the producer side. So now there's a little bit of discrepancy on the producer side uh, for the producer to connect to the broker. The producer needs to know like a broker list. It doesn't need to know all the brokers, but it has to know at least one live broker. And uh, we use that uh, information URL for the, bro for the producer to issue some get metadata requests. Any broker can issue, can serve those metadata requests. Basically, it gives you more detailed information for this particular topic, what are its partitions, and where are the partitions hosted, and who is the current leader that it should connect to. Yes, it's right. On the consumer side, today, the consumer has to know the zookeeper. Okay, but we, uh, we may evolve the API in the future to, uh, to reduce that dependency. Okay, any other questions? Can you go back to the slide when you ha where you have the leader failover thing? Yeah. Yes. Uh, you, wanna, so you want me to go back to that yeah, slide? Yeah, that'd be great. I'm just curious if you do any kind of like smart election because... So let's say a leader fails, right? And you said you have like a replica B and C, and in your case, you elected B. How does the election works? Right. You have like okay, some so kind of like, like maybe you can just uh, go through this, right? Do you have some kind of like a yeah, timestamp or something so you could do like a smart AI election, which would potentially like involve multiple round trips, but you could find like a potential like a replica, which is like the furthest down the yes. road? Yes, that's definitely possible. So that's a good observation. Um, so when the kernel leader fails, uh, in our protocol, we just, we, can, we just randomly select one of the replicas in ISR as the new leader, um, which is okay because at least uh, every replica in ISR has the committed data so we don't lose them. Um, but some of the replicas may be more further along than others. So if you want to preserve more data, maybe what you should do is to pick the replica that has more data in it. Okay, so it is possible. Uh, we haven't uh, thought about how to implement that. It does add a bit of complication when the leader election happens because when it happens, you probably need another round of coordination to figure out who is longest. Now you have to worry about things. Uh, what, yeah, what about, uh, do I wait for all the surviving uh, replicas in ISR to respond to me before I make a decision? Or do I wait only up to some timeout, right? What if I don't get all of them within a timeout. So there's a little bit uh, 
sort of subtlety that you have to think about, but it is possible. I was just curious, yeah, because uh, you already have this offset thing, and I already imagine that's kind of the thing you use for like synchronization and stuff, and mm -hmm. you could like yeah, use this. Right. So it is possible, but one of the things we try to optimize is when there's a leader failure, right? You are, this is a pro pretty severe problem because your system is not available until you elect a new leader. So when this happens, our primary goal is to make the leader election as fast as possible. So the fewer coordination you have to do, the better. It makes it more highly available. Our secondary goal probably is to say, you know, maybe we can preserve more data if possible. Okay. Any other questions? I think that yeah. one is first. Yeah, the black one. Okay. All right. I have a couple of questions. Uh, the first one is, how does the replication happen? Is it serial or parallel? Yeah. So the replicate if uh, the repli you are talking about a replication of different followers, that happens in parallel. Okay, each follower fetches his own data independently. So it has his own socket connection to do the fetch. Okay? It's independent. It's not chained, if, if that's what you uh, ask for. So we are not, yeah, so we are not forwarding the data from one leader to the first follower, then to the second follower. Instead, the first follower and the second follower, they fetch the data from the same leader in parallel. Okay? That's the... And the other question is, uh, so in the terrible case that you lose connection to all your Kafka brokers, yes. what happens? Right. So in the disaster case, if you lose all those replicas, then your system is, at least for this particular partition, it's, uh, it's the same story as before. It's unavailable, which means you can't read or write to it. You have to wait until at, at least some replicas come back. So our, our system is designed for supporting the common failures, which is either you are doing this uh, rolling restart of your server, or you have this uh, unexpected failure, but it's uh, isolated. It's not really designed for having this uh, catastrophe uh, failures. If you have that, I think we do have this asynchronous replication mechanism across two clusters, typically across two different data centers. And you can use that as your sort of DR recovery story. But the client itself cannot locally Stuff that could be sent out later. Uh, currently, because we don't. Uh, right. So currently, we don't have that. I think on the producer side, the producer only buffers things in memory. If you can't send for a considerable period of time, those data cannot be queued forever. They'll be just dropped. Uh, I think uh, there's some people are interested in having like a local data a log to persist those, those data. Uh, it's possible. We haven't fully thought about the trade-off uh, of doing this. Uh, one caveat is if you want to do this, then there's more storage you have to manage because on the broker side, typically there are fewer of those brokers and then you can actually configure them and manage them properly. But typically there are a lot more producers than the brokers. Then if you have managed all the local storage among those producers, typically it's a bigger problem. Okay, that's a caveat. Yes, there's another question. I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned a couple of times the RPC protocol, so I was wondering what protocols is like native to Kafka, what, what you guys use to talk to it. And the second question is, um, how big is an average cluster for you guys? Is there tens of nodes or hundreds of nodes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the first question is on the RPC protocol. I think uh, currently we have uh, our proprietary RPC protocol. So it's not any of the standard uh, um, protocols that are used in uh, GMS, and uh, one of the primary reasons we did that is, especially on the consumer side, uh, on the consumer side, remember one of the bullet points I covered is, at the lowest level, we are using this sandfire API that allows us to send some bytes from a local file to a remote socket channel directly. So that bypasses a lot of all those application layer, right? So, uh, so if we do a proprietary protocol, that makes it easy. If you want to implement some existing protocol, that makes it harder because uh, now you can't do any transformation. You, can, you have to take some bytes that's sorting the fire and send it directly to the server. Or another approach is you just have to lose this optimization. You have to copy your data into your application space and then transform it and then send it over. And then you lose some of the efficiency there. So does that mean that when I want to talk to a Kafka cluster, I have to use like a client library that you guys Yes, that's right. What, that, what uh, t today, I think uh, we support uh, Java API, but uh, various people have been building uh, 
other language bindings, at least on the producer side. On, uh, uh, so there's C implementation, maybe some some of Python implementation, and going forward in a way that we try to maintain at least a C library, so that you can hopefully you can build different bindings on that C native uh, library on the producer side. On the consumer side, currently it's a little bit tricky because consumer side it has to handle a little bit the rebalance logic uh, and it uses zookeepers. It needs a zookeeper library, but in the future we do try to make it thinner so that we can make it easy to bind to other languages uh, other than Java. And for your second question in terms of cluster size, our current setting, the cluster is really small. I think uh, it's probably around uh, 10 servers. But with replication, of course, you are storing more data. And our plan is to grow the cluster to the order of uh, maybe 15 nodes or something. But we do have multiple clusters for different use cases. But each cluster is in that order. OK. Yes, another question? Okay, uh, so last question. But if you uh, but if you have questions, yeah, you can talk to me offline or talk to the talk to me during the meetups. Yes. Okay. Well, no, I'll go ahead and ask the question yes. since I have it. Um, that's making sound. So I I am a little bit confused on the protocol. Mm -hmm. Is it considered committed when all of the followers have responded, or have have fetched past it, or is it considered committed? when a committed marker has been received by all of the followers? Yeah, I think uh, the protocol is uh, when you have a message, uh, that message essentially has to be received by all the replicas in right. this uh, in sync replica set. Which they all have to move past that marker okay. before you can, commit, you can consider this committed. So okay, the marker so the for M1 means uh, you are, uh, you, if M1 is considered as uh, committed, then the marker is actually the next offset, which marks everything before it as committed. I but it doesn't, it, it doesn't. I'll, I'll, I'll sit down okay. on a piece of paper because I want to understand okay. something. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks a lot.